In today's video, I'm talking about short rows, and to be completely honest with you, I've got questions, and I suspect you do too. So if that sounds like just your cup of tea, get cozy and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Midweek Ramble. My name is Taylor and I will be your host. Folks, I have been drawing diagrams of short rows for the last few days and I am kind of obsessed with this whole idea of adding short rows to shape the neckline of a top-down sweater. Now, I am in the process of designing two top-down sweaters. I am not a knitwear designer. I'm doing this as a foray, if you will, and I'm learning along the way. I am a lifelong learner, and this is just a step in that direction for me. But it really does have me asking a lot of questions about the ins and outs or long and short of short rows. I have an understanding of them enough to execute them in my sweaters to achieve a particular look with a crew neck, but that's pretty much as far as that goes. And I know that a lot of folks who leave me tips over at the tip line have been asking lately for a video where I shine some light on short rows and what the deal is with them and how to use them to shape various different parts of a garment. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't have all those answers for you because I'm just not that experienced of a knitwear designer. However, what I'm really good at doing is finding those answers and narrowing it down to resources that make developing that understanding a little bit easier. And so really what I wanna share with you guys today are some questions I've had about short rows, some findings or discoveries I've made, and then I wanna directly point you in the direction of some fantastic resources from the experts that you can go to today online to help you understand short rows, what they are, why they are, where where they are and how they are a little bit better. The first thing I want to do though is what all of these short row videos do is I want to just give you a quick and dirty, you know, understanding of exactly what short rows are. And this is going to be very quick and, and from a layman's perspective, okay? Like I said, I'm not a professional knitwear designer. I am a a, a, a learning knitwear designer, whatever. You know, I'm just, I'm still learning. And so I want to show this to you coming from that perspective. Now, this is my dress form or mannequin Gladys and she happens to be tangled around my ankle okay she happens to be wearing a little top-down number that I'm working on right now this is called um the little black tee I know it's not black the first one was this one's not but we're gonna roll with it and this is a raglan constructed top-down little t-shirt that has a really nice kind of high and tight fitting crew neck well, in order to achieve the crew neck, the way that you see it here, where the bottom of the crew neck, the front neck sits lower than the back neck, and, and we have to have that to accommodate the human form because our back neck sits up higher than our front neck, I used short rows. Essentially adding rows to the back here or additional fabric to almost hoist the back of the sweater up, which would cause the front of the sweater to be lowered down. And, and really, when it comes to a raglan sweater, and I'll talk about this in a minute, it's less about lifting the back of the neck because it already kind of sits up pretty high in a raglan construction. It's about lowering the front neck. So by adding some short rows that go back and forth, I'm creating a wedge of fabric back here that just provides a little bit more fabric to essentially offset things a little bit and you can actually see that happening you can see the difference in uh distance here between the first black stripe and the top and if i flip it around you can see that there's far less gray between that first black stripe because there's fewer rows up front than there are in the back and that's to again accommodate that offset and that's to create a really nice fitting crew neck so just really quick and dirty that's what short rows are. They're partial rows that are worked around the neckline to create a little crescent shape of fabric. Imagine like one of those faux collars that you can wear to create a little crescent shape of fabric that's almost inserted into the design to offset the front and the back of the collar. That's as far as we're going to go today in terms of how short rows are used. You can use short rows for so many different things to shape portions of a garment, but we're only talking about the neckline today 
because that's most relevant to me and that seems to be what most people are asking about. So I'm gonna set Gladys off to the side and we're gonna dive into this just a little bit. So with all of that in mind, that and that's my basic understanding and I kind of use a little bit of a standard formula for how I add my short rows and where I place my turns but I don't know enough about this process to understand, or at least I didn't before, what would happen if you changed the placement of things in short rows. Now, a really good video to watch to give you kind of the basics of how, why, when, and where you would add short rows and what the short row layout actually looks like. There's a video by Knitting with Frogonette, and I believe it's actually called Why, Where, When, and How Short Rows. And she gives you a really great visual, kind of like what you're seeing in my notebook here, and talking you through the process of short rows using pen and paper. And if you're a visual learner like me, it's a really excellent excellent place to go to get that visual representation. So start your journey of discovery with short rows at that video because I think it's a really great place to just get that jumping off point to what exactly short rows are, quick and dirty with a really nice visual. One question I tend to have, and I know others tend to have as well when it comes to adding short rows to a garment, is how many short rows do I add? What is the significance of the number of short rows that I add to the garment? And what's happening if I add more and if I add less? And I found a really fantastic answer to this question, or at least a partial answer to this question, over at the Unapologetic Knitter on YouTube on Knit Talk episode 26. She talks about shaping a neckline using short rows, and she tells you what what you can do and what you just can't do with short row shaping and I felt like this was so helpful because it shed some light on what's happening every time you add a short row and how you can't just continue to add short rows because you'll run into some pretty significant roadblocks. She talks a little bit about the importance of understanding your shoulder slope which is this situation happening here and in order to do that you kind of have to work some triangulation where you figure out um, you take a ruler kind of like out the side of your neck like this like right at the base of your neck and you figure out this distance right here and that's your shoulder slope and that distance is used to determine how many additional short rows you need to add to accommodate the slope of your shoulders. This was so enlightening to me because it gives you a frame of reference and a place to start if you happen to be modifying a sweater that does not already call for short rows or if you're modifying a sweater that you don't think has enough short rows or that you think has too many short rows and you might notice the sweater has too many short rows because you're getting this weird bunchy fabric thing going on in the back which means it's overcompensating for your shoulder slope or you might find that you're adding short rows to a raglan top-down sweater with a crew neck and you're still getting that choking effect in the front where the front of the neck is pulling into your neck that means you don't have enough short rows to help offset that front and back well, by listening to what she talks about in this video, you're getting a little bit of an idea of where you need to go in your gauge swatch and on your body to determine how many short rows you need to have in that sweater to accommodate your shoulder slope and your back and front neck. An interesting takeaway from that, among other things, and I'll talk about more things I took away from that particular video in a second, but something interesting is that the average adult person has a sh shoulder slope of about one and three quarters inches and that because of that average most knitwear designers are working anywhere between one and two inches as an assumed shoulder slope when they're figuring out how many short rows to add into their pattern so it's a jumping off point you have your own shoulder slope that is unique to you but it is also very helpful to know that there's kind of an average there and so even though everybody's a little bit different, most often we're gonna fit within that average and that can be comforting, especially if you're starting to break into knitwear design where you're knitting a pattern that needs to work for multiple different shapes. Another takeaway from that same video and kind of in the same vein of what we just mentioned with shoulder slope is that everybody most likely has a maximum number of short rows they can add to a sweater for their body before they get that weird puckering effect that happens in the back, before you get kind of like a pocket of fabric back there. And theoretically speaking, based on this video, that maximum number of short rows is exactly what you get when you figure out your shoulder slope. However many rows you need to knit to accommodate that shoulder slope 
is how many short rows you can have before you start getting bunchy fabric. The fact that there is a maximum is really comforting. I love when you have a set standard when trying to determine, I don't know, a design element because you know that you really can only work between two maximums, a minimum and a maximum before you kind of get to a point of no return. And having those there are nice because it's the road markers, they're mile markers, they're kind of barriers that keep you out of the woods. And so I thought that was really helpful. And that is all included in Knit Talk episode 26 from the Unapologetic Knitter. And I'm going to tell you right now, she has so many helpful videos. You need to check out her channel and subscribe because if you're getting into designing your own sweaters or modifying your sweaters, she is a very helpful resource. Now, another question that I had, and this is one that may come up for some, is how to know to go from longer short rows to shorter short rows or from shorter short rows to longer ones. What's How do we know when to do that? Now, when I'm knitting the sweaters that I'm working on right now, the two that I'm designing right now, we are going from shorter short rows to longer short rows. And that's just because that's all I've ever known to do. But there are different ways about doing this. Now, I'm going to use this little t-shirt here on Gladys to kind of illustrate this. And so I'm going to pull her in here. And when I have done the sweaters that I've done, we start short row shaping. We kind of knit in just a little bit. And then about right here, you can kind of see the mark I've made. That's where we stop and that's where we turn and we come back this way and I'm working around the back and I come over to this side and I do the same thing. I'm right here and then this time I turn and then I work a couple here and then I come back and I'm going to go back this way all the way back around. Now here is where I started before. You can see my start right here, but I'm going to overshoot that this time by a couple of stitches. I'm going to start here now and then I'm going to work my way back all the way back around here. And then I'm coming back this way and I'm going to overshoot what I have here and come back this way. Every time I'm doing this, my short rows are getting longer. Come on over here, Gladys. Let me grope you. Sorry. You can see that I'm overshooting every time I come back around. I overshoot and then I turn and I go back and then I overshoot the wrap and turn and then I turn and go back. Those are short rows that go from shorter to longer. You're overshooting the wrap and turn by a few stitches before you turn. But then there are short rows where instead of overshooting the wrap and turn, you're undershooting the wrap and turn. You're creating a wedge going a different direction. And that was interesting to me because I feel like most often when I see short rows used, I'm noticing that you're knitting beyond the wrap and turn and then you're turning, knitting beyond the wrap and turn and then turning. But there are instances where you're going to knit short of the wrap and turn and then you're going to turn. And I wanted to understand the significance of that difference. And there were a few places that I went that I felt gave a really, actually one particular blog post, but or one particular blog, but two different posts that describe exactly what's happening here and shed a little bit of light on why you would do one over the other. This is really rough. This is not science. This is just a ramble. Sorry, Gladys. I sure hope that didn't go through. Good, we're safe. Take your new t-shirt. Now, one thing I picked up from this and one thing that I gathered was that when you're working a top-down raglan constructed sweater, you're working with a neck hole that's essentially a square. You have some stitches for the shoulders, which will turn into the sleeve stitches, and then you have the front and the back. And the way that that sits on your neck, it's kind of like a square. And a square like that is the front and the back both sit pretty high up on the neck. So it's not really a matter of raising the back as much as it is a matter of lowering the front. And in order to do that, you're going to add short rows that start out short and then grow longer because you're adding more fabric to the back while keeping the front relatively limited, which is what you saw with my little striped t-shirt. Little bit of fabric in the front between the gray and the black stripe, a lot of fabric in the back between the gray and the black stripe. 
And that's because that is a raglan constructed sweater. You need to lower the front, not necessarily raise the back. This information I gathered from the blog by Talvi Knits, where she talks about how to improve the neckline of a top-down raglan sweater. This was a gold mine. Not only did she talk about kind of what's happening here with short rows, she gave you the exact instructions to knit short rows for a top down raglan sweater. Now, of course, how many short rows and all of that will really be determined by your shoulder slope, but this is a fantastic place to get started. Now, she also has kind of a sister post for that, which is how to improve the neck shaping of a circular yoke sweater. Now that's a little bit different, a circular yoke sweater, and she has some really great diagrams that show this, and I'll pop them up here. A circular yoke, a circle, if you imagine putting a circle right around your neck and sitting it down over your shoulders, it's going to be level in the front and level in the back and kind of sit down. It's like a, a reversible sweater. The flax sweater before it had its um, short, short rows added to the pattern, it kind of was reversible. It was the same place in the front as it was in the back. And that can be kind of unappealing to some because you want to cover that upper back neck, right? It just seems much more visually appealing to raise things up a little bit in the back. Well, with a circular yoke sweater, you actually do have to raise the back neck, which means you're going to be adding your short rows primarily to the back of the sweater, not necessarily as much to the front of the sweater. You're trying to push the fabric up in the back, which means you're going to work longer rows to shorter rows working down the back. Now, this blog post clarifies this beautifully and she actually tells you how to avoid some issues you might run into when doing it this way for color work sweaters and she gives some really great alternatives on placement of your short rows one that i thought was really interesting was instead of placing your short rows up here in a circular yoke top down sweater you place them under right i think it's right after you separate for sleeves or right before you separate for sleeves but it's further down on the sweater achieving the same result, but a better placement than up here on the back of the neck, which can be kind of visually jarring if you have a color work pattern going over there. So I definitely recommend checking out Talvi Knits. She's going to lay it all out for you in terms of short row shaping for a circular yoke constructed sweater and a raglan constructed sweater, especially when it comes to shaping that neckline. Now, something else I've realized is that this method for shaping a neckline, especially in terms of raglan sweaters, seems to be relatively new because when I go back into books that I have that are much older and knitting from the top by Barbara Walker or sweater design in plain English or even the knitting without tears and the Elizabeth Zimmerman um, knitting almanac and the sweater knitting workshop very few if any of those ever mention shaping the top of a neckline using short rows there's another method that they mention and this is one that is mentioned on the Talvi Knits blog as well as a better fitting alternative to to shaping the neckline of a raglan sweater. In fact, you've heard me mention recently, if you've been watching the last several episodes, the Karen Templer blog series, How to Improvise a Top-Down Sweater, and she promotes this method as well. And it's called the Staggered Start Approach to Shaping Your Neckline. It's where you're essentially knitting your back stitches, your sleeve stitches, and a couple of your front stitches back and forth flat adding stitches to the front of the neckline as you go, which will really help to kind of dictate the shape of the neckline, as well as shaping the rest of the sweater in preparation for fitting it around your shoulders. Now on Talvi Knits blog, where she talks about um, how to use short rows to shape the neckline of a raglan sweater for an improved fit, she goes into how to do this. She calls it the staggered start. However, a really in-depth look at this process can be found on that Karen Templer blog, how to improvise a top-down sweater, because this is the method that she prefers for getting a really nice shaped neckline for a top-down sweater, especially a raglan sweater, but it also opens up a lot of opportunity for playing around with actual neck shape, v-neck, scoop neck, boat neck, all of these various different things that you really can't do with short row shaping alone. It kind of makes me wonder, and, I'm, and I, I understand using short row shaping if really what you're going for is just a basic crew neck because it's easy, it, you don't have to knit flat and then cast on additional stitches. It does the job that you need it to do to get a nice fitting crew neck. 
But sometimes I wonder when it comes to short row shaping, is it being done as like a quick band-aid for these reversible sweaters that kind of fall down in the back? Are we just adding some short rows in there to just call it a day and give it what it needs to lift the back up? Um, or is it really the best approach to essentially shaping the shoulders and, a sh and shaping the neckline of a sweater? And I kind of wonder about that. I, um, yeah, I, you see it everywhere. You see it in all of these top down sweaters, really well known ones from the no frill sweater to the Felix pullover. Short row shaping is used to shape that neckline to kind of offset the back and the front a little bit. But I wonder if there's an improved fit should either of those sweaters be modified to include an applied neckline or a staggered start neckline like she mentions in Talvi Knits. It's interesting. Um, I would like to explore, I, I think it would be interesting to explore taking a sweater that uses short row shaping at the neckline and modding it so that instead of the short row shaping, you're actually doing a staggered start neckline. And in order to understand how to do that, you definitely need to check out these resources that I mentioned here because of course this is not a tutorial for any of these things, but rather a place to provide you with a roadmap on where to go to look to start your journey on learning more about short rows. So in review, I'm gonna lay out here the resources that you definitely need to check out to develop a better understanding about short rows around the neckline, how to use them, where to place them, how to know how many to create. And I think that that starts with Knitting with Frogonette, the short row video, why, where, when, and how short rows. It's a great place to go to get that real quick visual reference and a little bit of a quick and dirty outline on why, when, where, how we use short rows. From there, I would move to Knit Talk episode 26 by the Apologetic Knitter because she's going to go into not only what they are, but she's gonna talk a little bit about what you can do with them and what you can't do with them, the limitations there, and give you an idea of what information you need to determine how many short rows you need to perform to fit your particular body based on your shoulder slope. I think that the information in that video is very insightful. She happens to be a tech editor and all of her videos are coming from that perspective. And you're going to be able to mine lots of diamonds from her channel, trust me. But in terms of short rows, episode 26 of her Knit Talk series is a really good place to go. From that, I would head over to the Talvi Knits blog. In particular, her how to improve the fit of a circular yoke sweater using short rows. And then the same sister post, how to to improve the fit of a neckline of a raglan sweater using short rows. She's going to talk to you a little bit about where to place those short rows, the benefits and the disadvantages of various different placements in a circular yoke. She's going to talk to you about some common misconceptions about how to operate those short rows so that you get the best shape. And then in the raglan pose, she's going to talk to you about that staggered start alternative two short rows to get you the best fit for a top-down raglan sweater if you would like to explore something alternative to using short rows at the neckline. Both of those posts are going to be really helpful in understanding what's happening with those short rows. And she does a really good job of kind of showing you what not to do, which I think is also equally helpful. And then again, the last place that I wanna send you because I tell you to check this out all the time and I really hope those of you that are motivated to do this are checking out this particular series. Karen Templer's How to Improvise a Top-Down Sweater. This is going to give you a lot of information about using that staggered start method in a top-down raglan sweater to get a really lovely shape to the neckline, but it's also gonna tell you how you can have a variety of different shapes to your neckline, not just a crew neck, because like I mentioned, you're kind of limited to a crew neckline if all you're doing is short row shaping. And that's pretty much it for me today. Those are That's where I've gone with this right now. Now, this is something that I'm going to be exploring more because I feel myself wanting to kind of just fall headlong down this rabbit hole. Sweater construction is really interesting to me. It's becoming more interesting to me as I work through two sweater designs and definitely moving into the future, um, wanting to practice that staggered start neckline more and seeing how I prefer that to the short row shaping method because I am learning that a lot of different folks have various, they experience different results with short row shaping. Um, because of their body shape. And I find that it's really not very universal. It doesn't fit everybody the same. I mean, nothing ever does, but I feel like there's a lot of opportunity there for things to just not go right or things to bunch up or there to be excess fabric. And I think that the staggered start neckline 
alleviates a lot of that. And I'm really excited to kind of dive down that rabbit hole and learn a little bit more about that in the future, which actually leads me to the knit along that is coming to the Patreon channel after the Frank and Cal is over. We are going to be doing a knit along where we work through the entire series that Karen Templer created, how to improvise a top down raglan sweater. I'm super excited for it. If you would like to help support the channel and be a part of that knit along, head over to Patreon. You can join now or you can wait until that knit along launches, which will probably be in late March. Um, mid to late March and see if it's right for you. But in the meantime, thank you guys for listening to me ramble about this. I know that it's a lot, but I'm hoping that this kind of serves as a little bit of a web quest to provide you with some resources of where to do some further research about short rows. And maybe all of that will shed a little bit more light on the process for you, empowering you to make these kinds of modifications to your sweaters, or at least to know whether or not those modifications are right for you. If you took any value from today's video or enjoyed yourself at all, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up, definitely subscribe and click that bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload new content here on the channel, which is every Wednesday and every Sunday. And like I said, if you'd like to support the channel further and view a lot more Wool Needles Hands content, head over to Patreon and see if it's right for you. Until I see you for Sunday's episode of the podcast, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.